The horror won't go away, but then neither do Megacans. This week, Megan and Conrad get some distraction from world insanity with a welcome visit from veteran Berlin tour guide and history raconteur Ryan Barmer. Also, Conrad goes off on one about German arms exports. Yes. It's time for another episode of Megan's Megacan. I am here in Berlin with Ex-Berliner Magazine, Conrad Werner, and we have a guest today. Sorry. Hello, Conrad. Hello. And I will introduce our guest. Um, I'm very, very, very excited today because I've been trying to get lovely Ryan Balmer to come and talk to us for ages. Ryan is a tour guide, long-standing tour guide. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. You are also a dual citizen. We were going to introduce you as a Scotsman, but that's now only half the picture. It's only half the story. I used my German passport for the first time uh, a few days ago, coming back in to Germany from Scotland. And I I threw it down uh, on the desk in front of the police officer quite enthusiastically, too enthusiastically, (laughs) I think. Yes, that's not a German. That's not. (laughs) And you also have been doing, I think, really much, pretty much since coronavirus YouTube videos. Yeah. Tell us a bit about... Well, I started doing online or virtual... Stop! Hold! Sorry! We're not drinking! Jesus Christ! (laughs) Oh, dear God. I'm really... I didn't want to say. You always have to tell me. I was like, I then start. I'm like, oh, no, wait. Um, The other thing... I didn't want to be rude, but, you know, I was promised mega cuts. (laughs) No, we've 100% got mega cuts. And I thought... I saw these today. These are fancy ones. We have... Bombay Sapphire and Tonic. Nice. We might as well, you know, it's got a picture of Queen Victoria on it. Because oh, these are quite posh. We'll go along with well, the so colonial bullshit yeah, that Bombay we're going to talk about later. Really, you don't to say Bombay anymore, No, you don't. <laughs> you uh, can't see anything these days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right, let's drink. Thank the Lord. Cheers. Cheers. That's delicious. Oh, that's nice, that. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it says it's vapor infused. What does that mean? Is that is that is that different from normal gin? Was it? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, think I should know. I do think. Have I? It's in a turquoise can. It's different. It's very very nice. It's classy. It's and yeah. I've just noticed it's smaller. And it's got a nice matte finish. It does. We do like a matte finish. <laughs> We do like a matte finish. That's the, the, the sign of a classy mega can. Yeah. W- was the vapors not what Victorians believed gave you diseases? Maybe. Like what a dose of the vapors. Oh, I thought that's yeah. how they treated diseases. What good vapors? So there was good vapors and bad vapors. <laughs> I don't know. I thought they kind of didn't they? Didn't you? Didn't you put a towel over your head if you had anything and and put like a put your head over My a mom bowl? Still used to make me do that when we were like cold. Well, with we the, cold. the menthol thing. It was awful. Yeah. yeah, like you breathe in, yeah, like you should like that. They boil like red wine with garlic and stuff. No, no, there's no like <laughs> paper rub, I think. Okay. But yeah. There's like an old, there's like a really good uh, concoction if you've got a flu or anything. You can boil red wine, garlic, onions you really, really always strong. You're making me do this, and then all you are is sick <laughs> and eating onions, and I'm just, all you want is like a day nurse. Just some paracetamol, get it into you. It's, anyway. Yeah. Back to back to Ryan. <laughs> We're just um, trying to avoid talking about the news. Yeah, yeah I can't imagine why. Um, <laughs> so you are, you are. Let me say, you are a legendary tour guide. Yes. You're not just any tour guide in Berlin. You've been doing this. You're a veteran. What Everyone, you mean, I'm an old tour guide. I'm old by tour guide standards. <laughs> but, <what> you mean. <laughs> but you are you, in the in the tour guiding scene. You are something of a of a of like the Godfather. Is that true? I don't think that's true. Um, I think. I, I've been at it for a long time, maybe longer than than most. But yeah, if anyone said that, then that's very nice. <laughs> and what's your favourite tour? What's your favourite? What what do you like to do? Um, I like I like doing Jewish history tours because it's in a neighbourhood that, although it's quite touristy, it doesn't include most of the the, the big sites that people to expect to see, apart from maybe the synagogue. Mm-hmm. And I think what people expect when they come to Berlin and they do a Jewish tour is a, is a tour which focuses on, you know, 12 years of either annihilation or survival. Mm-hmm. And like most cities that have or had a large Jewish community, there's obviously much more to the Jewish history of the city than that. Mm. So whilst I 
definitely don't avoid talking about the Nazis or the Holocaust. It's not the only focus on the tour. And people genuinely come away surprised. And what's really interesting is it's mostly Jewish people who do that tour with me and they usually come away surprised by just how established the Jewish community was, just how uh, diverse it was and just the, the, the lasting impact that it had on the city or right. still has on the city. Wow, that sounds really good, yeah. You should go on it. Yeah, I've been on one of Ryan's tours. So have I. Which one did you do? I went on the, like, I think it was something to do with street art. It was fascinating. Oh, yeah, I mean... I, I still talk about... That was the alternative tour, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I I used to do them a lot more than I do now. Uh, for two reasons. One, I, I got a bit funny about taking big groups of people into Kreuzberg. Quite hypocritically, I think it coincided with me moving to Kreuzberg and getting really pissed off with big groups of tourists around the place. I think it's a really great neighbourhood to show people off to, mm-hmm. but I, I think it's too invasive to have large groups. Yes. Uh, but I do take small groups there or couples or yeah. individuals who yeah. are interested in a more contemporary side of Berlin, you know, not just the gate and the Reichstag. And, uh, and which one did you go on? I think we did we did the general sort of Nazi history one. We I, went around the Soviet memorial in, in the Tiergarten. We went to the Holocaust memorial. Yeah, the Lusgarten definitely as well. Um, yeah. I think it was a, maybe a... St- Dark party or something you were with was that it right? was someone's fortieth birthday. Fortieth birthday, okay. Yeah. yeah, it was a fifth. Yeah, it was a group of Englishmen. A group of Englishmen, middle-aged Englishmen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I made them do the history. I was the organizer of that okay. weekend, and and you were an integral part of that. I do remember. And, uh, I remember it was a small group. Um, but like, yeah, I do remember being on the loose garden with you because. Uh, your brother, of course, had something to say about it. Um, your brother <laughs> said that he felt I was unprofessional when I uh, gave my um, subjective opinion on the TV tower. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As a as a as a tour guide, do you feel like you have to be objective about things? Or um, do you let your your political leanings? I, influence your tours I think if anyone goes away from my tours without an inkling of my political leanings then they, they've not been listening um, okay. but having said that in the last few years especially since Trump came to power uh, there was a lot of discussion with some of my colleagues about what our what our role should be you know hmm. because in some years maybe a majority of our clients are American hmm. and they're usually middle aged I guess, on average. Um, the ones that come to Berlin on, on their own steam here for a few days are usually Democrats. And you know this because they tell you very quickly. But the ones who come in from the coast on the, the big cruise ships are overwhelmingly Republicans. Right. And you know because within five minutes, they're asking you about the Muslim problem. Really? Yeah. So as things got more politicized from American visitors, lots of us began to react to that in different ways. I th- I know that some colleagues felt it was their responsibility to to openly challenge not just negative comments like that, but I think we've all got a responsibility to, to respond to racist comments, racist questions, but to, to kind of deliberately draw parallels between what happened in Germany in the 30s and 40s and what is happening or might happen in the US. And I disagreed with that. I didn't think it was our responsibility to explicitly state that. I thought it was our responsibility to make it as abundantly clear as possible that what happened in the 30s and 40s here could happen again in the right circumstances. And to try and explain it in a as clear-minded a way as possible, that if someone can't see the parallels with contemporary politics, then they're probably beyond saving anyway. And it's not our responsibility to beat them over the head with our ideology. But I guess you must have difficult conversations sometimes with some of your customers. Yeah, I mean, or- I think... Possibly because they they suss out that I'm maybe not going to go along with their more crazy right wing ideas early on. Right. People tend not to to be too challenging, but definitely in the last few years there was more of that than there was in the previous maybe ten years as a guy. Okay, um, like there was a a retired doctor from Tennessee and his wife who were here. I think it was it was I could tell you when it was because it was exactly the time when that Supreme Court judge was having to talk about his uh, his oh, past and how he was Kavanaugh uh, Kavanaugh yeah Kavanaugh. yeah and uh, they were they were they were um, absolutely horrified by the fact that he was having to talk about his his past and they were saying that the 
the woman who accused him of sexual assault was uh, was lying and was doing it for publicity. And, and that was a really difficult day because that was going on. And um, at one point, I was talking about the the uh, the Nazi mass extermination of people with disabilities. I was talking about the T4 monument on Tiergartenstrasse. And the, the, the lady said, she said, of course, this is what the Democrats want in the US. And I said, I don't follow. And she said, well, you know, if Hillary... Uh, got to power, then she would in- increase abortion rights and people would abort disabled children. So that is genocide of the disabled. And this oh, is exactly geez. what the Nazis did. Oh, and that's a, that's a, they love that argument. Yeah. It's it's obviously just... It's, it, uh, yeah, there's not much reasoning with these people. But that that's a doctor? Uh, a doctor and his wife. The doctor, he was the same guy who said to me at some point that the... <laughs> I'm laughing because it's so horrible, but he's, he said um, he said he's always been confused as to what race the Jews are, is what he said. And I said, well, what do you mean? Can you clarify your confusion? And he said, well, there are only three racial groups, uh, Caucasian, Negroid, and Mongoloid. And I said, well, <laughs> I'm no doctor, but I don't <laughs> think those are the terms that we use these days. And also the idea of the... The, the sort of three race theory is also deeply old fashioned and has been debunked. And he said, well, I have, you know, 40 years experience as a physician. I know what I'm talking about. And no, 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 you don't. the end of the conversation. But this is a very extreme Sorry, and case. your job, your, your, your role in your <laughs> practice or the hospital is to, what, classify people into these three groups? That's yeah. your 40 years of experience. Dear God. I don't, Ryan, I don't know if he was a phrenologist or not, but um, I, but that's a really extreme case. You know, every, more, the vast majority of my clients are not yeah. like that. And um, even if they have political opinions that I don't necessarily agree with, there's usually a, a pretty balanced atmosphere on the tour, you know? Yeah. Uh, also, now you have you obviously like many people you've struggled in the pandemic with your business, and so you've started doing videos, online YouTube tours, and how are they going? They're going okay. Um, I, I was terrified of any kind of technology, but my, my friends got me uh, like an editing suite for my Christmas, one of these Adobe things, and I struggled along with that for about a month. Yeah. And I'd been doing virtual tours for a, a company for a few months as well during the lockdown. So I unified those two rudimentary skill sets and started to make videos. And the first couple did really well, like much, much better than I thought. Because quite a few colleagues had tried stuff like that and they were finding it difficult to get any more than a you know a handful of views. Hmm. So the first couple did really well and I got very excited about it. And then I possibly got too excited about it and made a, a very, very dense two-part video about the the parallels between Christopher Isherwood and David Bowie's time in Berlin. Which we all adored, I mean, by the way. I enjoyed it. <laughs> That's the main thing. But yeah, there was quite a lot of tangents in that that maybe uh, lost lost people's attention a bit. But they're, they're up there, they're online, and I'm, I'm pretty proud of them. Yeah. But yeah, I'm very still having fun with it, and I'm going to be doing it for as long as I've got time. But your latest video... <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> is... About the Humboldt Forum, Schloss. Yeah. Uh, and you tell the whole history of the, the Schloss itself, the building itself. Mm. Do you go into the uh, do you go into the exhibitions that are inside now? Uh, I, I don't in the video. I, I, wrote, I wrote an article um, for a guide association website, which was much more in depth about three or four months ago. And even that just focused on the building. Right. Right? I, there is a kind of a disclaimer at the start where I said, look, I'm not really going to address the the issues of, you know, stuff nicked by colonial Germany. I think that's terrible. And I think that's a huge problem that they're going to have to solve. But my focus was on why that building is there and why the other buildings are no longer there. And uh, the short video I made recently is mostly focusing on that. But I did, I have visited a couple of the exhibitions and I went just a couple of days ago to the Berlin Global Exhibition. And my opinion on the building has changed slightly. I would say I... I hate the building, if anything, even more than I did. Oh. Um, Successful exhibition. Welcome, <laughs> but, but the exhibition is great. That's the thing. Is that okay. the exhibition is a is an example of I think the good side of Berlin, which is it's quite it's very confrontational. It's very radical. It's quite fun. It's quite daft. It's very diverse, 
Uh, it's kind of all over the place. It's, it's, it's exhilarating. It's exhi- yeah. everything that Berlin should be, but it's trapped in this enormously stuffy, reactionary project. That and it seems to be completely at odds with that project, and that's what made me dislike the building even more. Was that this is the kind of thing we we should be having in Berlin, yeah. but not within not this context. We talked about this on a previous episode, but it was ages. Like, what is the sort of controversy around the Humboldt Forum? When we talk about the building itself, why is brief? Yeah, um, to remind myself. No, well. so there had there had been a, a palace of some description there since uh, the, the late fifteenth century, early eighteenth century. There was a big yellow uh, baroque building constructed there uh, that became known as the Stadtschloss. And it was where the Prussian kings and the German emperors spent a lot of their winter times. That building was really badly damaged in the war, mm. arguably beyond saving. And like all the good stuff in the historic centre, it ended up in the Soviet and later East German side of the city. By 1950, those powers decided to destroy what was left. Mm-hmm. They said it was a symbol of imperialism. They said it was a symbol of uh, Prussia, which was a, a deeply unfashionable state by the post-war period. And in 1976, they unveiled this new building called the Palast der Republik, which included the East German uh, Volkskammer or People's Chamber, but also a huge amount of facilities that were open to the public. And it was open to the public. I've, I've read and I've heard people say that it was you know, just for the party officials and their pals and their families. It's absolutely not true. It was a Western newspaper claimed that there was 11.6 million visitors in the first year alone. So it was an enormously popular building. Mm-hmm. Bowling alleys, beer halls, cafes, okay. discos, sports clubs, concert hall. Um, after German unification, there was big discussions about taking it down because it was undeniably a symbol of a regime that was oppressive and corrupt mm-hmm. and failed. It was also full of asbestos, but <laughs> it's not exactly unique when it comes to that. I mean, the uh, the Mesa building out west is also full of asbestos, but it yeah, was... You don't have to tear a building down. You absolutely do not. And I know that the Mesa was given um, a Denkmalschutz as a protected building. Um, so they can't knock it down. hideous. Uh, I love oh, the no, Mesa. Oh, no, wait. But... <laughs> I'm thinking wrong. No, it is kind of cool. It's very impressive. I mean, a lot of people didn't like the Palace de Republic, but I would argue that the, the style of it was in keeping with it at least a vaguely modernist tradition in Berlin that was particularly active in the 20s and 30s. It was a modernist tradition that was all but destroyed by the Nazis, and I see it as a resurrection of that, rather than a, a symbol of purely, you know, quote-unquote communist architecture, whatever that yeah, is. But also, we can't just keep going around tearing buildings down and rebuilding them with <clears throat> regime. I mean, we can. But it's it's, it's just, yeah. it's expensive. It's a case by case thing, you know. I mean, we we have we have a bunch of buildings in Berlin that are very much in use today that were built by the Nazis. Absolutely. We, we, the Olympic Stadium was was built for a and it is. a propaganda heavy Olympic Games. We still yeah. use that, you know. Yeah, yeah. We still use the finance ministry. Uh, the, sorry, the former Luftwaffe headquarters as the finance ministry. Yeah. There's there's lots of examples like this. So it's all yeah, it's okay to use those buildings. Yeah. All, all the all the old. Um, sort of Nazi war ministries mm. on Wilhelmstrasse were, on, were still standing and still being used. Yeah. Like, like Goebbels' ministry is still being used as a ministry now. Yeah. Do you remember the Palace de Republic? Were you ever in there? I didn't see it, unfortunately. I, I, by the time I came to Berlin, it was about 2006, and it, I remember seeing fragments of it, just the huge kind of reinforced concrete skeletons that were left. Yeah. Mm. And that was it. I remember when they were, so they, when, they were, when they were sort of halfway through taking it down, they opened it as a kind of exhibition performance space. Yep. And I did actually see a show in it once in this sort of this, this sort of half broken building. What did and you I see? Like a, I saw a, a kind of alternative opera. Some, all I can really remember is someone singing the, the, the Liebestod from Tristan and Isolde yep. on a boat. They actually floated a boat inside there. They must have flooded it somehow. Did you get on a little boat and go through it as well? No, there were no. I was on the shore. I was on the side. Okay. But the the, the singer was on a boat. Uh huh. And uh, that's the only thing I can remember. This must have been like two thousand 
five or six something yeah like that. yeah there was a couple of years around that point it was when they yeah. had the the big uh Zweifel thing on the main entrance or doubt yeah uh, for a few months um there was a few concerts as well like uh, neubalton played there berlin industrial yeah. band and i mean yeah, i think was there was a couple of years where it showed a, a really interesting possibility for that building um and there was like there was a huge public campaign. I mean, people really wanted it to stay. Yeah. And there was a huge stack. It was a massive, massive uh, controversy. And and you know, like I remember that it was like it was it went on for years whether or not we should tear it down and yeah. what what they're going to do. And everyone like the popular opinion was to keep it, but um, they'd already made plans. Obviously. Yeah. It's a bit like with the airport. They'd obviously they'd already made plans. So. They had to close all the other airports that people liked. I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons why ultimately it was taken down and this thing was built in its place. And one is aesthetics, definitely. There, there's this odd decision taken that Berlin was at its best at a very specific point in time. And mm. if we're going to rebuild the palace, then that means the point in time that we're really choosing is when Germany was an empire. And yeah. all these buildings looked at that specific point like they do now or you know now they're I suppose Walt Disney versions of those buildings but I mean I fundamentally disagree that that was the golden age in Berlin's history I mean who, who makes the decision to, to to pick a moment pick a date when the city was at its best and also the, the idea that this was what the island or Museum Island was meant to be like is, is nonsense it's in a constant state of flux like the big cathedral that I think many people think has been there for centuries was opened at the start of the 20th century all right. So they were constantly changing and adapting based upon usually the whim of some dictator or yeah. Kaiser. You know. So they did tear it down, and what you just referred to as the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Give us, play us, play us a, a mental picture. It's, I mean, it's it's all it's quite difficult to even explain because it's so preposterous. Even if you're standing in front of it, and I've found it in yeah. the last few months trying to explain it to tourists, they look at me as if I'm I'm, I'm exaggerating or making this up when I. I point at this thing and say there's not a single original component and what we have here is a, a three-sided replica three facades of an 18th century baroque building none of the facades contain anything original there are some original components in fact but in the cellar um and inside when you walk in it's uh it it feels and looks a bit like an airport um and inside there are a handful of museums and from what i've seen because i've not seen all of them some of the museums are pretty good and the Berlin Global exhibition is, is excellent. So this is like, because I've only seen it from the outside and it, yeah, it's this three-sided facade, like you said, and then you go walk around one side and it's just like this very modern yeah. thing. But when you go in then, so it's not like they've done the sort of stuff inside, it just looks like a big modern airport hangar. Um, the, the portal which faces the the west of the city is double-sided so when you're standing in the foyer where you buy your tickets and so on you are looking at this like very grand baroque exit as well so there is okay. this constant collision when you walk in between the old and the new mm -hmm. and uh, two of the courtyards have a kind of a like a half and half kind of approach a bit like the building's exterior where it's mm -hmm. this uh yeah very contemporary uh unadorned the concrete facades next to baroque ones so you're constantly being confronted with that but then once you get into the the kind of the the bowels of the building, I guess, and you get into the museums, then it's it's all modern. Mm -hmm. So from outside it's seventeen oh seven, and from inside it's for the most part twenty twenty one. Does it does it work? No, no. Um, it's just it's, it's baffling. It's absolutely baffling. And one of the things that I do like about the centre of Berlin is that you do have like very interesting modern architecture right beside the thing, but not necessarily in the same. <laughs> I just I think it's something that we'll be regretting in the city for a long time to come. Um, yeah. And I think if you if you love Berlin, then you have to love its sometimes quite clumsy, sometimes quite ugly diversity, and that's what we had on that island before the palace was knocked down. Yeah. And now what we have are uh, representations of styles that people who are generally quite conservative and who actually think are appropriate. Yeah. The, the destroying the, the communist era building is it's about aesthetics but it's also about this um, post Cold War triumphalism mm -hmm. um, which is really dangerous and if you're looking for a smooth segue into the last part of the conversation <laughs> then there you go 
Okay. It's a war time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like a, a war started, Megan, since the last time we were, did a I podcast know. in Europe. That's quite a big thing. Yes, sorry. And I know I'm like complaining about having to hear about it, but obviously it is completely awful. Um, I've been following it a little bit. But what I haven't been doing is looking very much at the German response. Well, because that's really go for it. <laughs> well, so what happened was there was a, a a massive demo last week, last Sunday. Some people said five hundred thousand. The police said hundred thousand. It was probably somewhere in the middle, as these things usually are. Um, a, 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 you know, like a really like a, like a big outpouring of support, obviously in solidarity with Ukraine. But nice. It was also nice to see. I saw a lot of. Georgians and Azerbaijanis out as well when I was there and uh, while this was going on there was a special session in the Bundestag in the parliament at which Chancellor Olaf Scholz gave a big speech about what he was going to do about all this and his and main part of the speech was he's going to increase the military budget by quite a lot and he's going to give the military a, a special bonus of a hundred billion euros just for one year like a special as well as increasing the military budget there's an extra fund Uh I didn't know the figures obviously (laughs) a hundred billion a hundred billion yeah to put that into context that is like two years worth of defence budget in one go plus the normal defence budget so that's that's like loads of money do you think it was going to be about 95 or 96 but they just rounded it up because it would sound bigger yeah it's it's a bit convenient that's a hundred make it make it yeah like three figures sounds good 100 billion is a lot of money uh, to give in one go to the armed forces. Uh, but they're not actually going, it's not going to the, it's necessarily going to, the, it's going to fund like the German military machine, right? Whatever you want to call it. That sounds a bit, bit of a loaded word. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, so everyone, like the, the international press was saying this is a huge. Uh, U-turn for Germany it's like breaking all these taboos like Germany's been such a peace loving country for so long and now it's going to militarise which is sort of true like yeah yeah, you know and also oh yeah and the other thing is they're going to start um, sending weapons to Ukraine which was yeah. also supposed to be a taboo right they're supposed to not they're, they're not supposed to send weapons into a conflict zone allegedly but everyone is knows is like a just like a according to what is that like a rule or is that like a just a it's not it's not really a, it's not a law no they just said they were going to do that and you're, we're not supposed to do that okay they're supposed to be because they were like when they sell weapons what happens is the there's a there's a little council called the national security council that's made of the chancellor and like six ministers mm-hmm. just the main ministers and they meet and they decide if a arms company a German arms company like Rheinmetall, if they want to sell some weapons to someone, it has to go through this council. So they have to approve it, and um, and and there's a and there's a report that comes out twice a year, which says which what arms deals were approved and which weren't, okay. Okay. and that's how it works. And um, yeah, and up till now, like it is true that Germany has like up till now refused to send small arms or any kind of arms to Ukraine because you know uh, apparently it's not a NATO member not an EU member and that was the rule like if it was a NATO member or an EU member then fine Uh, these were called green countries and then there were red countries which were third parties which are outside NATO and EU but yeah and that is like that is quite new because especially in this current situation because there's like a like an armed conflict going on and so we're directly putting more weapons into an arm that was like a that was a taboo but it's not true that Germany has not ever sent weapons to countries that are in conflict like for example Saudi Arabia was a huge buyer or or even indeed it to does tend to be like it must be hard to sell arms not to people in conflict well this is what I keep saying <laughs> like, like, like I mean... there's a limit to how many tanks Norway needs you know yes they don't six yeah. Whereas, whereas Egypt and Turkey, they really like having tanks because they're, you know, like Egypt's a military dictatorship. And in yeah. fact, Egypt was the um, biggest customer of Germany, according yeah. to the latest, uh, latest report, annual, annual report. So 
and Israel also gets a lot of German arms. Like it's not like it's a, and those countries are, you know, in sort of dangerous crisis regions. They're called like crisis regions. So I think it's like, I think it was like slightly overblown by the international media how much of a U-turn this is what I'm getting okay. at. Okay. That's all I really wanted to say. <laughs> so how how is this 100 billion going to be spent? Is it just going to be lots more of those uh, torchlit rallies that we've been having recently? Or? <laughs> Uh, well, apparently, the, um, one of the big ones is going to be uh, they're going to renew the um, the Eurofighter, the uh, airplanes. The um, so they're going to because they cost an awful lot of money, like like fighter planes. And, okay. And up to now, they've been using these old ones called Tornadoes, and now they're uh, renewing them and um, building a better one. And also, they'll probably spend an awful lot of money on armed drones. I mean, 100 billion doesn't get you that many warplanes, so it's really not that much money, is it? Well, yeah, but it's like on top of the unusual defense budget, right. which is about 50 something, 50 or 60 billion. Okay. And that isn't, that is still a lot. Like, um, if you, if you were, if you calculated it per capita, Germany already has a, a higher defense budget than Russia. Like, the Russian defense budget is like 68 or something billion a year, mm-hmm. and the German one is like 59 or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And uh, so, and the French defense budget is also only like forty something billion, and the UK one is like like fifty. It depends who you who you which website. I've looked on different websites, and sometimes the UK is higher than Germany. Sometimes Germany is higher, but there's like a like like Germany already. The point is Germany already spends a lot on uh, arms mm-hmm. and always has done, and already and has a lot of. Um, major weapons building companies like Rheinmetall who build the submarines for uh, and uh, um, Heckler and Koch who builds like um, machine guns that are used all around the world by most of the NATO armies use Heckler and Koch machine guns so it's a big thing yeah I don't know I just think that yeah I, I mean there has been like a thing about the armed drones thing because the the SPD famously were against armed drones against their they're okay with the Bundeswehr having drones but not armed ones and that was a whole issue for many many years and the SPD was always against armed drones and that has changed now pretty radically now we have an SPD chancellor and he's like we're going to have armed drones so that makes that is a big difference but in general I wouldn't say that Germany is like an uh, an, uh, what what is true is that I don't think the army is very well um, they've been very like very efficient so like there have been loads of stories in the last few years about how only about half of the helicopters work and about half of the tanks work because they because they don't because they can't they don't have the right spare parts and, and the maintenance rusty. takes long. Yeah, they because they're really complicated machines, so they have to keep renewing them and and so at any given time, only about two thirds of the the heavy heavy war stuff is actually working. So we do like a rely, rely on. Yeah, the, the kind of American presence in Germany, which is still really big. Um, although Trump wanted to get rid of all the American, that was the that was the moment where um, the left party and Donald Trump were on the same page. Was when he wanted to <laughs> he wanted to pull out all the all the American troops, or like he wanted to reduce the number of American troops in Germany by two thirds, which is like which is really big and. Um, and the left party were like, yeah, that's See you later, great. That's thanks. what we wanted. That's what we've been campaigning for, for ages. And yeah, so that, that's that been in the news quite a lot. I think it is like it is sort of different, but it's sort of like, you know, Germany w- has bent the rules quite often, is what I'm saying, on its <laughs> arms exports. So this as, is not as much of a, a, a leap as it's no. been portrayed in the, the press. No. Yeah. And it's not like... And and they could have like sold tanks to Ukraine, but they haven't done that. They've sold like loads of uh, these sort of small arms, like the the anti anti aircraft and anti missile defense systems mm. that you can and um, and rocket launchers and things like that. Soviet area rocket launchers. So I think that yeah, I think relatively it's all a bit political situation. <laughs> no, and I think like it is somewhat beyond our remit as a German politics podcast with booze to like try and make sense of it. I just, but any further than sort of how Germany is responding and, and things. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's just terrible. <laughs> like, it's just like, I do, yeah, it's awful. But are refugees coming to us? I think they are. Yeah. You were saying today, Ryan, that you'd seen... Yeah, there was a few things uh, on social media today about um, Germans in um, the Hauptbahnhof in Munich and I think also Berlin, which I was mm-hmm. surprised at. People standing on the platforms, holding signs, welcoming people mm-hmm. and offering them um, temporary places to stay, yeah. which was obviously a lovely sight. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's in kind of sharp contrast to what I was reading yesterday about the, the situation in Poland. I mean, Poland is right on the border of the Ukraine, mm-hmm. obviously, and they have so far accepted hundreds of thousands of refugees, but there's already some horrendous stories about uh, non-white refugees being yeah. mistreated or turned back. Yes. Nothing like that in Germany so far. Uh, well, and it probably won't happen, not. hopefully, but it's definitely happening down there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole of Europe's refugee policy has changed quite quickly especially in Poland because Poland mm. were, were the country that said like we're not taking any refugees this is too many Germany can have them you know yeah. and now Poland has been really really good about these the Ukrainian refugees they've had they've taken in 500,000 already I wonder why that is and uh, I can't quite get my head around that <laughs> yeah. I can't quite get my head around it either um, yeah oh god but I guess we can just try and do what we can and some of the media coverage as well has been like really uh, you know and this is not news to anyone but like disgustingly couched in these like racist terms and just like un like how does it get past an editor in like 2022 like this is a c- civilized I don't know I, th- I know? think it's not it, it's bad enough that they're they're trying to make this uh, somehow vastly different to what's been happening in, in Yemen and um, lots of countries across the Middle East for a long time. Um, but I think they're also trying to convince their viewers that after decades of demonising Eastern Europe generally as like a dark and shady place, that actually these are the people that we should care about all of a sudden. So I don't think it's just that they're saying that these people are better than these these Arabs, which is yeah. obviously one of the big issues. Um, but it's also them trying to kind of make up for what's happened for decades now, definitely since the yeah. fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah. This, like I said, kind of Cold War triumphalism, but yeah. also this uh, general kind of xenophobia about the East, you know, uh-huh. in inverted commas. Uh, because the media representation of people from Poland and the former Yugoslavia and absolutely Ukraine in the yeah. last 25, 30 years has yeah. been overwhelmingly negative. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden they're trying to convince their viewers that these people that we've been demonizing and belittling uh, are people we should be caring about all of a sudden. And it's amazing watching them trip over themselves trying to do this. What do you want to talk about now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, Thanks for coming on, bro. Ryan. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to get off your chest while you're here? Yeah. Um, you got, uh, no, I feel quite selfish. I'm, I'm generally really happy. <laughs> How's your mega can? Do you enjoy mega it? can's really good. I just came back from Scotland, had a great time there. I saw my family, showed my partner Edinburgh. That was great. I'm, I'm generally in a really great mood. Um, you know, apart yeah. from the war and shit, everything else is going very, very well. <laughs> and uh, do you drink a lot of mega cans in your in your? Normal life? No, I don't. I'm not a mega can man. No. Oh, you I not? I do enjoy one now and again. Uh, okay. If I'm going to like a an outdoor um, event of some kind, uh, it, or I no, mean, mega cans are for all kinds of events. I drink too quickly and they're too strong. Is my issue. They are strong. Yeah. They are. They are. This is and this is a smaller one. But it's, it's lovely. Something. It kind of matches my outfit. Yeah. So gin and tonic, Bombay sapphire. Very nice. Can recommend. Can I ask, what's the best mega can you've drunk on the show? <sighs> it sort of depends on my mood, to be honest. I do like the gin and tonic ones. I think probably if I had to have a de- Desert Island one, it would be the Gordon's gin and tonic, just because I just it's the right mix of sweet and delicious. What's the worst? Um, oh, there have been some really bad ones. So there is a Gold Kona, which is like the cheap... Oh, brandy yeah. kind of thing that they made yep. and we I got two of those once with cola and I don't think we could finish them no 
I mean, I don't like the ones that were the, with like tropical fruits in them, maracuya, that kind of thing. Are the gold corner ones also uh, a hangover from the DDR, Ben? Are they? I think they might be. So if you say you don't like them, They're that's definitely a hangover. You're also doing a cold war triumphalism <laughs> oh, if you don't enjoy those. You can't say anything this time. <laughs> Well, actually, the one thing that I really noticed in when I went to the Humboldt Forum was that they were selling Rotkäppchen in the in the bistro. Yes, <laughs> yeah. And Rotkäppchen is a, an East German brand, mm-hmm. but they were selling it for nine fifty for a glass. Yeah, they were for a glass. A twisting almost, the like, fucking <laughs> knife with that one. <laughs> a glass. A two yeah. milliliter. Not milliliter. Two centiliter glass of what kept you in was nine fifty in the bistro. The bistro, not the restaurant. Burn this! I think we need to burn it. It needs to be destroyed again. And I found that yeah. like I kind of a interesting that they chose what kept you in of all the sparkling wines they could have chosen to sell in the bistro because obviously they were trying to make some kind of reference to the history of the place, but also then b just like overpricing it so flagrantly I just thought I, was, I found that quite offensive but just generally making the prices in their bistro um, way above what, what they should be and yeah, that's and such a huge contrast to what the Palace de Republique was all about which was meant to be um, cheap affordable facilities for the public it's they, they don't bring it to your happened. table you've got to go with the tray along the thing it's like a canteen oh for fuck's sake you don't, there's no table you service you be paying nine euros for a glass of anything that you're having to fucking ferry to your own fucking table yeah oh god that's just enraging like we, we don't want to return to the DDR but like I really like the idea of the bowling alleys and yeah. the discos all yeah. in one place and there was concerts uh, you know Santana played there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there was some good stuff. Yeah. I think Harry Belafonte probably played there as well. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's all we've got time I think, for. I think that's all I've got, sort of, <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming, Ryan. Thanks for having me. It was lovely. Yeah. Thank thanks you. very much, Ryan. And um, see you next time. Hope we're all still here and there hasn't been a nuclear war. I keep signing off conversations like this and it's kind of fun but also you know terrifying and obviously yeah let's just hope it stops soon bye ciao